Hello, everyone. My name is John Malmros. I'm one of the volunteers here at the library. I'm also a volunteer at Mystic Seaport. So I'm especially pleased to be introducing this program tonight because we'll be taking a look at how nautical expressions have influenced our wonderful language. Uh, we'll be hearing about some of the very many expressions which are part of our everyday speech, but which originally belong to the world of sail and of uh, seagoing activities. Um, and we may even have a little fun with a few that only sound as if they came from that world. Uh, to do this, we're, we're very fortunate to have with us tonight Steve Telsey, who's been on the water and around boats since his youth uh, spent on Long Island Sound. Uh, Steve's sailing experience covers a vast range from uh, solo sailing his Rhodes 19 from Mamaroneck, New York to Newport when he was 17 years old, all the way up to skippering uh, the Sloop Clearwater beginning in 1975, I believe. Um, in his younger days, Steve was uh, a member of the Ithaca, New York Fire Department, and he continued in that occupation as the uh, deputy director of emergency management in Concord, Massachusetts, before relocating here to Mystic in 2016. Uh, he's continued his uh, participation in public safety as a member of the Quambog Volunteer Fire Department, the Borough Volunteer Fire Department, and the Mystic Fireboat Crew. And of course, he's kept up his many interests in his vast interest in the sailing and boating life as a volunteer also at Mystic Seaport. And just to round out an already very impressive sounding resume, during his time in Ithaca, Steve was also a cook at the legendary Johnny's Big Red. So please welcome Steve Telsey. Thank you, John. Thank you, Noy. I want to thank you and, and call it an invitation and for getting me set up. And this is better. Probably better view. A little quick introduction. Um, if it's working, this is pretty much. Those are the kind of boats I would sail back in '75. 80, 85, like that. But as you'll see, most of this comes more from the 17th, 18th century um, tall ships back then, not so much the modern ones, something more along the lines of the ones you see there. Sometimes I'm asked why, why bother? Uh, <laughs> little, little, uh, yeah. Let's see here. Um, part of it's a personal interest, and part of it's just having some fun with your terminology. I was an English major a long time ago. Um, some of these I bring a smile to my face. I hope they bring some to yours. I have to have a disclaimer or two. I'm going to try not to read the slides. Um, if anybody doesn't need me to read something, let me know. Um, otherwise, I may try and paraphrase. Basically, I'm, I'm not an entomologist by trade, so this is just sort of fun and games. And although I do like large boats, I also do small boats at the seaport, and I'm a proud member of Canoe. <laughs> I'm glad to see if all of you are informal. Nobody here is informal. One of the terms is rest for nines. The question of when I first heard this is nine what? And I'm trying to think nine what pieces of clothing, buttons? I mean, that's a very small, 
strange outfit to be in. It's just buttons, a, you know, pants, shirt, what? Yeah. Where's the nine come from? So one of the things to know is the early ships, the warships, were three masts and three spars. Now, unfortunately, the pictures I'm showing don't have the, the three masts and three spars. I don't really have any of the other warships. Constitution is close, but it's sort of a special case. The other thing to know about dressing a ship is to adorn it. So put flags on it, banners, things like that. So that's the constitutional dress. Then the question is, where did the nines come from? And when the captains really wanted to get fancy, they were returning to victory. King or the queen was going to be usually in London or wherever. They would get all in their finery. I use that term loosely. Um, sailors were now at sea for months. Their finery was semi-washed canvas or whatever. Um, but they would put them up on the spars. So again, these are modern school ships, mostly training ships. Uh, but in the old days, it would have been three masts, three spars, nine, the rest of the nine. You were doing really fancy. Some of these people, it does look like they're in white pants and some kind of blue shirt or jacket or something like that. That was not the case normally. However, there was one, and there was a captain who decided to dress up his people. I'm assuming he paid for it. But he put them all in blue and white jackets. This was on the HMS Blazer. That's what he came up with. Little debate because roughly the same time there was a Lady Margaret had a boat club that still exists in England, and they had a blazing red, a little fancier, and. Supposedly, the story is the blazing came from that. So, there are the two blazers, and I'll let you take your yeah. Technical error. John, you let me down. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that probably you didn't pick up the blazers at a rummage sale. Um, we think of the rummage sales today of you know, garage sale, church bazaar, something like that, used clothing. It does come from damaged goods, usually in a warehouse. Um, they were sold off at reduced rate or given away. Um, usually water damage, sometimes pilferage, things like that. So that's a more modern view. That's sort of the damage you might get in a warehouse. Those are, those are more modern. Couldn't find any pictures from the 17th century of damaged warehouse goods. And there's one that's about to become a rummage sale. <laughs> one thing you probably didn't buy even at the rummage sale is use your slush fund. And we, we think of that in a couple of ways today. We've got the slushies, the drinks, and the slush fund that, you know, very often an administrative assistant or somebody keeps in the draw. Basically, it's something you don't have to account for. Way back when, the most of the food was salt pork and things like that in barrels, probably a third fat. And when they cooked it down, they had all this slush, which was basically the fat left over. It was a perk, and the, the cooks collected it they took it ashore and sold it. It was used for tallow, soap, things like that. But the, the big deal was they were supposed to use that to buy little treats or extra food for the crew. Um, I think more often than not, it probably went into the pockets of the cook. So that's today's slush fund of that kind. Yeah, this is sort of what it looked look like. <laughs> not, not really great. Um, in any event, though, some of that stuff, at least at dinner time, actually ended up being piping hot. Need to figure out why piping. I mean, we've heard that phrase, and it's like, 
You also should know that breakfast and lunch, if they got them, were cold. They were gruel or a cold oatmeal, something like that. The only hot meal aboard was probably dinner, such as it was. <laughs> anyway, this is the actual call. I excerpted about 10 seconds. It actually runs over a minute. So if you waited for the whole thing, I'll bet your food probably was not hot anymore. <laughs> Just as a little warning on that. One of the things they didn't get on this nice salt pork or salt beef was a nice sauce. And A1, which we think of as a steak sauce. Where it comes from is Lloyd's of London. 1700s, they raided ships. And A was the condition of the ship. A was A or B, the letters. A was a brand new ship. B was pretty good if it, you started going down the alphabet. Probably wasn't something you wanted to sail on. <laughs> and the number had to do with the condition of the, the ship. And it, it's not the, the ship itself, but all of its parts and pieces. So this is how they explained it. And then the question is, how did we get? So now we've got the A1. So if we say something is A1, it's basically from Lloyd's of London. But how do we get to the sauce? Oh, let me go back. Nothing new here. If you notice, it says the fine, fast sailing brig Prince Edward A1 at Lloyd's. You know, always use it as a good advertising. You know, approved by OSHA, approved by underwriters, laboratories, whatever. Dates back 1859. So, so this is a, just a little aside on where the, the sauce came from. And I looked it up. A1 is now, I forget the company, is now bought it out. But Brandon Company is still in existence, but they sold the rights to the A1. So, And that's the one you probably recognize. Moving on to drinks, and this is one that, this is mind your P's and Q's. Anybody heard that one about? I have to admit, uh, the story is that the barkeeps kept track for the sailors of their pints and quarts, right? So there weren't any arguments of how many they had had. I have to say, I'm not really sure I'd buy that. There's some alternate explanations. Uh, P's and Q's for printers or young students. If you've ever set type, it's backwards and sort of upside down. So getting P's and Q's confused. I almost take that as, as a maybe. Um, the please, the P's and thank Q's. I honestly don't remember where I found that one. I, that one's a little bit of a stretch. Um, however, Think about it. I, I, the P's and Q's may have fit for your local pub with, you know, 20 or 30 people that well recognized. I'm not sure 100 drunken sailors showing up on the, you know, I, I don't know how you keep tabs. You, you'd need eight people doing nothing but keeping tabs on the blackboard. On the, but anyway, um, it's one of those terms sounds like, and a lot of people say it came from boating or the seaside taverns. It's one of the ones I have to admit probably didn't. Um, here's one you probably do know, scuttlebutt. And this one is used very much today the same way as it was back then. Slightly different containers. Okay. The butt was a cask, and I'll show you that in a minute. The scuttle was a little hole. If you scuttle a ship, you put a hole in it. Scuttle was a hole in the barrel. So. First off, it, it, the question is, what's a butt? So here are all the ones from a pin to a firkin and all the way up. A butt is about 2,000 cups. And part of the reason they had the small scuttle, they didn't carry a lot of fresh water. So you had to dip in with like a half cup ladle so people didn't waste water. And that's what they did. It sort of cut down on the, on, so people didn't waste water. 
So that's sort of a sketch of an early one. And there's a more modern one. And other than it not being a coffee pot, <laughs> it, it's basically the same kind of thing today as it used to be. If you add a little bit, probably not too much water, but if you add a little bit too much rum, you might be on a binge. This is one that took me by surprise. A uh, binge to a sailor was to soak. And the enterprising sailors would rinse out the barrels. Sometimes they broke them apart to save space. Other times they just rinsed them before they were going to be reused. They would wash them out rather than just dump it in the scuppers. They enterprisingly put it in cups and <laughs> drank the dregs of the barrel, the rum or sherry or whatever was in them. Um, I think they thought they were getting alcohol. I, can't believe there was much there. I think they were probably getting the taste. But um, anyway, that's where binge comes from. Slightly different meaning. I think that's probably what we think of for binge. Um, there is a different kind of a binge. First one sort of empties your mind, and the second one empties your wallet. And then the other day, I came upon this, and I, I couldn't resist putting this in. So if you go on too much of a binge, it'll pack a wallop. And this is one named after somebody. Um, there was an admiral that was sent to, um, to France in retaliation. France had done a bunch of damage to England. They sent him in retaliation. And if I've got it right, he went over, uh, he burned 21 towns, demolished several harbors, and all of the French ships in two ports. So, and his name was Admiral Wallop. So that's where we get Wallop from, or at least that's one claim. You may have heard this one, Sun Over the Yard Arm. Today it's sort of five o'clock. Back then they, they started at 11 o'clock. The officers about 11 started with their first little tip. They, a lot of the, Crew didn't get it, but the officers did, and usually it was before lunch. Um, actually, somebody very enterprising with, I've got to admit, a little bit too much time on his hands, calculated the average height of a seaman standing on the after deck in the mid-North Atlantic, and which yard arm, <laughs> and what was the hour going to be? I don't know. And verified it was probably around 11 o'clock if it was the four yard. But as I say, he did the whole geometry and all of that. Um, I think that's, that's very nice, but true sailors, doesn't really matter which yard arm. <laughs> we can always find one. Here's the original of overwhelm. I mean, right now we sort of use it that way, but I, to be honest, never thought of it as being totally overturned. I would think of it's defeating somebody or something like that, but it actually meant overturn. So those are two vessels overwhelmed. And the tall ship Astrid is well on its way to being overwhelmed. I don't know if it ever really did turn over, turn turtle, which is another phrase. One way you could get overwhelmed would be a ground swell. And we had some last week when the, the hurricane sort of blew by. But basically, it's, it's something. It, Foretelling a, a distant storm usually, but foretelling a storm coming, so you'll start getting the rollers coming in. And I think we may get some this weekend, actually, from the one off Florida. So this is what we think of today as groundswell. And that's more of what to the sailor they thought of as groundswell. And there's a famous painting by Edward Hopper on groundswell. 
Here's one that definitely it sounds like with the wind and all of this that it came from the sea. This is one that probably went the other direction. It actually did start probably in the orchards and went from shore back to uh, to boating when they do talk about the, the windfall coming. Usually not so much good luck, could be, could also be too much wind. But that's really the windfall. Bonanza is another one, almost sounds like it goes with it. Um, I didn't understand that this has two meanings. Um, one is very night, calm weather, um, light breezes, wonderful sailing, sort of like today, although I'm not sure how the wind was today. Um, it's got another meaning too, and it came more from the gold rush and from the English Spanish um, meaning for a mother load. We think of this sort of bonanza this way. To a sailor, that was Bonanza. This is another one I had no idea that, and I'm not even going to attempt the pronunciation, but it basically came from pirates or freebooters, and they wanted to stop or take something away. They tended to use force. Um, somehow that changed and morphed into the way we use it today, where basically we're using it. Here were the original freebooters or, or pirates. Today we sort of take things away or stop things in their tracks by, by speech. Although I guess in some countries they get into fisticuffs on the floor of, of their Senate. If you're getting into a filibuster with somebody, you're probably at loggerheads wondering where that came from. Very interesting. These are in the old days, they would tar deck seams and hulls with black tar, sort of like on the roadway, that kind of tar. Probably not a good thing. It was flammable, so it was probably not a good thing to heat directly, um, especially on a wooden boat. So they tended to heat big iron balls or rods and stick it into the tar to melt it. Well, the sailors found out it works very well for caulking the decks and, and seams. You can also fling the hot tar at boarding parties and things like that, so it became a weapon. They also, this is what they look like, the ones on the right, certainly you could swing that around, and that was a heavy iron protrusion at the bottom. So, But those were used into the tar. They also was cannonballs, I'm people familiar with, I'm hoping some of you have read Ramage and all of those, um, Hornblower and some of those, and they talk about chain shot. They may also talk about bar shot, and that's what the bar shot looks like. And that was also known as a loggerhead and did a lot of damage when that came out of the cannon and started spinning. Took rigging down very nicely. If you're at loggerheads, you might well be armed to the teeth. This one's a little strange and Port Royal in Jamaica was known in the 1600s as a haven for pirates, um, sort of a safe haven. And they think that's where a lot of the stories about the pirates and pictures like that, some of it may be a little fanciful, but that's the best they can come up with, with where armed from the teeth may have come from. It did originate back in the 1600s. If you were armed, or got into battles aboard the bosun on board the ship, might well blow a gasket. And when you first think about that, 16th, 17th, 18th century boats, no engines. We think of gasket as head gasket or exhaust gasket or something on an engine. There weren't any. So where'd that come from? So one of the things you need to know is basically sail ties on square rig ships are called gaskets. And that's what we think of today. But if you can see this, there's short lengths of line. And when this gets rolled up, I'll show you a picture in a second. 
Um, that becomes the gasket and gasketing the sail. And you can imagine if the wind catches that and blows it out, you start getting a lot of flapping and a lot of loud noise with the, in a high wind, the cracking canvas, not unlike a gasket blowing on an engine. As I was looking at this, I, I almost put in some additional stuff on here for another phrase. So I'm gonna mention it anyway, uh, basically uh, learn the ropes or know the ropes. Gives you a little visual meaning. I mean, there were, they were hundreds. Um, on some of the big ships, there were 14 miles of line in the running and standing rigging. And if you can imagine all of these coming down to the deck and the pin rails, the sailors had to know where they were dead of night in a storm by touch, right? Because they couldn't see, can't go look in a loft and try to trace it out and stuff like that. You had to know the 17th one on the port pin rail, whatever. Um, it was quite a feat. Um, but I just thought I'd put in the know the ropes to them was quite literal and quite very necessary for, for life. <laughs> They're furling in the upper left and bottom right, you can see the sail ties or the gasket right there. So we're gonna go from high aloft to down below and meet this gentleman. Um, they didn't have a devil on board that I know of, although I guess some people thought the captains were probably devils and they didn't have their hand out. The full phrase is the devil to pay and no pitch hot. Okay, so this is that hot pitch I was talking about before the black tar and to pay a seam is to caulk it. So if you put tub caulking around, you're paying the seam around your tub with, with uh, silicone caulk or something like that. Back then they were using hot tar. Still leaves the question of what's the devil how does the devil figure into this? We've got the pay and we've got the pitch. Here's a, another phrase that sort of gets into it. Caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. Okay, and again, caulking, and I'm going a little bit uh, astray from the term, but what's the devil seam? The devil seam was just one that was very difficult to work with. I got three candidates for you, and we'll see if we get into generate some discussion here. Um, first one is the top seam, basically at the deck level, fairly long seam. Second one is way down. This is the garboard right at the keel. So it's also a fairly long seam way down low. And then you've got the water line. One of the things I want to point out is on these ships, they had tumble homes. So they, they tended to curve back in a little bit. So that seam right under the, at the deck line was not quite as long as the water line. So, so here are the three candidates. The first one I don't think is that difficult to caulk. It's, you could almost hang over the side. It's way up high. The second one, I believe if that garbled seam is showing, you're aground. Um, I doubt you're sailing along trying to caulk if, if that's actually exposed. Um, that would be pretty tough. The third one is exposed. It's long and you are caught. You're hanging over the side in a bosun's chair to try and put hot tar into that. So top one, it's the side away from you that you can't see. But on the lower picture would be that seam right in right under their feet. And you can imagine sitting the boat is not nice and probably steady. It's probably bouncing around, but you're in a bosun's chair and trying to maneuver one hand for the ship and one hand for the hot tar, trying to get it somehow into that seam. So, don't want to beat a dead horse, so we'll get off the devil seam. So where did this come from? One of the things for, for sailors, Many of them were given a month's advance when they first signed on. And part of that was they were going to be away and they didn't get paid off until they got back. So some of that first month's advance 
Some went to their families. If they had, had a family they wanted to support, so that first month salary went away, or they were buying clothing, um, tobacco, um, knife, equipment, whatever they needed, they were going to be away six months, a year, two years. So for that first month, that money's already gone. By the time they step aboard, basically it's gone. So that first month they're working for free to them in their mind. Um, at the end of that month, to celebrate that now we're going to start getting paid again, they made an effigy of a, a horse. Sometimes it was one that somebody could stand in, partially in, sort of like at some parades, there's dragons. And, and they would go through the ship and, and the other sailors would beat on the horse. They would then hoist it aloft and then cut it down, and drop it into the sea. And that was their, their celebration of the end of the month. So there's a dead horse. I'm not sure if this is actually a picture off the Conrad, but if you want to see it, the, the celebration is sometimes done at the seaport. I don't know if they're still doing it now, but they used to do it at least weekly. And um, I, I know I just saw a horse up in the sail loft the other day, so I know they have a new one. There's another viewpoint, of course, and that's if you were a mate or a captain trying to get any work out of those people for the first month. <laughs> pretty useless experience and to them it was about as effective as beating a dead horse so slightly different perspective while we're on animals we might as well go to cats and uh, i like cats i don't put them in bags <laughs> two competing theories here one totally on shore i'll give you that one first it has to do with uh markets and they would sometimes show you a nice suckling pig and when you went to pay for it they would substitute a cat for the pig in a bag when you got home you found out you had just bought a cat uh, <laughs> but on uh on ships the cat was the cat of nine tails so this is basically a whip with a handle um what i wanted to do was find a picture of somebody like popeye if you can sort of think of that with the big huge forearm, the body of the cat, and then go into the nine tails, the nine lives of the cat. At the end of that, um, those little knots were blood called blood knots for a reason. Um, but basically, it was the bosuns, when they made these up, they put them in a red vase or felt like bag, and they hung them outside their cabin. So it was al always a reminder to the sailors that that was lurking. And if they misbehaved, that cat may come out of the bag. So it wasn't necessarily a surprise when it came in out and it certainly wasn't anything you looked forward to. A little added one here, they sometimes put you on a grate if they had it. Sometimes they strapped you to, uh, to a mast. The other thing, third way they sometimes did it, it is strapped you over a barrel. So there's another phrase. So to be over the barrel wasn't usually a good thing on these ships. By and large, we're getting close to the end here. One of the things to know is, is for sailors, sailing by is to sail close hauled. And I'm gathering most of, hopefully most of you are sailors. I'll show you a picture anyway, but sailing on a close reach or, or beating would be sailing by, sailing large, sailing downwind, broad reach or a run. If you know that those big square rig ships did not point very well, they did not sail into the wind very well at all. Um, a couple of them did. They were fairly decent. Um, when the wind was very fluky and changing direction, you ended up sailing by, sailing large, sailing by, not necessarily tacking, but you, you kept shifting between close hauled and, and reaching. Some ships did it much better than others. <laughs> so the by and large is, by and large, some, some ships did it fairly well. This is one sailing by. and sailing large. So, and this one happens to have 
stencils or studding sails out on there. If you weren't sailing by and large, if it totally the wind died out, you might have to tide over. Two different meanings here. Sometimes you could sort of drift. They say phrase tide, it's probably with the current. You're probably not getting very far other than up and down with the tide. Uh, but one way was to do that, and hopefully it didn't, didn't last very long, so you could tide over a short period of time. Sort of like getting a short-term loan tied you over. The other meaning was more tied, and if you came to a sandbar, some of these vessels to get across waited for the tide and could sort of drift or row themselves, pull themselves over the sandbar. So they would tide over a sand spit or something like that. Coming to the end, sailors, I think I've conveyed, could be fairly dangerous. We haven't gotten into the diseases and all of that, but they got beat up by mates and bosuns. Um, they fell from aloft. Um, they ran into storms, all kinds of problems. If they died at sea, unless you were a famous captain or an admiral like Nelson, being brought back to England or to France or wherever for burial, you were buried at sea. And normally that was done by basically stitching you up in your hammock. And the story goes they put two cannonballs in to weight you down. And the last stitch supposedly went through your nose. And the story that grew up was it was to one, make sure you were dead. They sort of assumed if you didn't feel the needle or the so this big needle going through, you probably weren't faking it. Um, they didn't know about comas and things like that, unconsciousness. And the other was to release the soul. A lot of sailors were very superstitious and they really didn't want the ghost of a sailor hovering aboard the, the ship. Um, I have to say that the only problem with that is the whole deal about the stitch of the nose didn't show up until the 19th century. Uh, it, they certainly were doing burial at sea. They still do them today. Um, the Navy does them. They can't always bring people back depending on where they are. Uh, and it is a very solemn ceremony, but if there is a stitch through the nose, it might've been done just to keep the body from sliding down in the, the hammock, but probably wasn't done for all of this other, and certainly in the 17th, 18th centuries, they, they find no record of this sewn up, the stitch, They're, they are sewn up in the hammock. So. That's it, I wanted to leave time. I, I ran that little thing at the beginning with um, loops. I wasn't sure on the timing how far to go. I've got about 275 of these terms. <laughs> so um, never sure how fast it's gonna go or how many questions we might have, but um, I thought I would stop it there rather than run on and see what questions, arguments, discussions um, any of you might have. Yes. Right. Obviously, splicing the main brace. What is what is that? Okay. Um, I'm trying to think if I get, I've got all I've got slides for for many of those terms. I'm trying to think whether I can go and grab them. I've got them sort of alphabetical. Let me explain the main brace. Uh, the main main brace was actually a, a a part of the standing rigging, not a not a brace on a sail. It was basically a backstay. On, on the main. Um, it took most of the tension. The original line was probably in the manila line was probably in six, eight, 10 inch line and it was cable laid. So are people familiar with? Okay. Um, regular, most rope today is right hand laid. If you put your, follow the, the curl, it follows a right hand. Cable laid is take three of those big ones and 
twist them the opposite way, left hand laid. Okay, so now you've got nine, three, three strands of three each. You can imagine if that gets shot away, you have to long splice nine times and get them to lay up correctly. So it was a very big deal for quite a number of sailors. Very difficult, probably being shot at while this is happening because you didn't want to lose your mast. And that's why they very often gave an extra uh, ration of rum at the splice. The main brace was an extra ration of rum for um, a reward for doing that job. But I don't even want to contemplate how you take that apart and long splice each one of the, the strands so and get it to lay up correctly. So, If you want, I can try and find pictures of some of this stuff. I've got some on the, the know the ropes. Let's see if we can get, these are not really set up for a show, so we'll see if we can, yeah. So this is what I was talking about before, they literally had to know them. Okay. <laughs> okay, Nelson's, eight, uh, the one on the left is part of, of Nelson's HMS Victory, 26 miles of line on board. Okay, not 26 knots or individual lines, but 26 miles of stuff up there. I believe the Eagle is someplace around eight miles. And that's the kind of thing you'd be faced with middle of the night, dark pitching deck, it's sleeting, storming out, and somebody says release the four top something or other, right? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> if you go on the uh, the Conrad at the seaport, you'll see they've got nice little brass labels along the pin rail and everything. Problem with that is you don't have time or the ability to read those at night. So that was for training. The Conrad was always a training ship. but And I think some of these vessels may have the little plates on them because you've got to learn them. But... They usually ended up at a pin either, well, the one up above is a pin rail that goes around the mast. And this one's along the deck. So they all ended up someplace. I think occasionally they might be cleated off to a boom or something like that. But oh, there's a little trivia. You've probably heard that there's only seven ropes on a, on a boat. Not really true. That's the seven that are very often listed. There's actually more than that, but most of the lines are lines, sheets, halyards, bunt lines, clue lines, um, gaskets. <laughs> they all have names, but they're really not ropes per se. But there are more than seven. Oh, this is getting into the rigging. Same picture, so you can get an idea of what's involved if you get aboard and you're an ordinary seaman and to become an able seaman, you need to know the ropes, so, yeah. Okay, five miles, 200 lines on the Eagle, and she's not a full rig ship. Take that one. <laughs> and somebody at the captain calls up and, and, and goes, take in the four to gallant something, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Go find it. Okay.
that's the Preussen. She's one of the P ships from the with Peking. I'm trying to remember Passat, Pamir. I'm looking at Sharon. Can you help? Yeah, Pamir, Passat, Peking, Preussen. It was a fifth or sixth. There, there were two more. I think they were known as the PP line. I don't remember the actual name of the the shipping line. German. And they did a lot of Cape Horn stuff, turn of the late 19th century, I think 19th into 20th. Peking was at um, South Street Seaport until fairly recently. I think it went to went back to Germany. Yeah. Um, any other terms I can try and pull up quickly? I mean, I don't, they're not on the screen, but any of the ones from that beginning early? Pipe, pipe down. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know that I have that because it, it's basically piped down. Piping is the way, especially in the Navy, and they still do it today. It, it, they do reveille by, by pipe it, um, rather than bugle. Uh, they pipe to quarters. They pipe to meals. They pipe to all announcements and all of that. And pipe down was roughly, I think today it's about 10 o'clock. Although with so many of the modern ships, they're running 24 hour cycle. So, you know, pipe, piping hot, they're serving meals 24 hours a day on, on most of the Navy ships. But um, pipe down was basically, yeah, silence after, it was basically taps. Um, but you were supposed to be quiet after that. Um, I'm trying to, there was just something else that that reminded me of with the pipe down. Yeah. Yes, belay is to tie off, especially to a, a pin or, or to a cleat. So to belay that is stop. You know, um, I don't I don't think I have a, some of these don't take very well to, I'd show you a picture of a cleat. Uh, <laughs> um, as you can see, some of these wallop, I couldn't find a picture of Admiral Wallop or a devastated French town. Yeah. <laughs> um, some of these others are cute. I mean, square meal, there's a whole bunch. Square meal, they were, they tended to be square wooden bowl sort of plates. Um, and that's how they were served. Uh, they stacked better um, and all of that. And I think I've got a picture of some of the old ones um, that also have little rims on them, little fiddles on the, on the bowl itself. Fiddle is the edge around a table to keep stuff from sliding off. So there's a little fiddle here to keep stuff from sliding. Um, but I, then I found a picture of a modern, there's somebody makes square plates, you can buy melamine or something. So you can you can get your square plates. Um, what else? Just a little background. So my father was a Marine World War II, and his father was a Navy uh, chief for World War One. My father used to use this expression, and I'm not sure if he, how he meant it exactly, whether he was mindful of the nautical term or whether it was just something that came to mind. But whenever we had like a holiday dinner and this one particular cousin was with us, it was quite chatty. And I remember I would always be in father or what, or get kind of tired of this chatty cousin that he was kind of remote and Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. That one I have, and, and that's got an interesting background, and it, it actually is PG rated. Doesn't sound like it. I know it doesn't. Um, let me see if I can find it. Yeah. I'm looking for it. Um, I love a man who's 
<laughs> well, I just have that spirit in my brain for every television. Does this include a pot of rum? <laughs> yeah. Um, let me see if I can. <laughs> let me just see if I can find it. This is going to be in a couple of parts. Okay. The original was, whoop, sorry. I thought I had gotten rid of that one. Too many slide things going on here. Sorry. No, it's not like it's going back to the original. Um, let's close all of these out. And let me start over. If not, I'll just talk about it. No, <laughs> it, it seems to be locked in on that. The, um, how are we going to do this? It's not going to show up, is it? Wait a minute. Ah. Well, okay. Since this doesn't seem to want to cooperate, I'm going to try once more. Yeah. This doesn't, yeah, I don't know why it's locked into that because I'm bringing up, I can see it on my screen. Basically, I had a picture of, of the snow monkeys in Japan coated in rhyme. What I wanted was one sort of looking down at some brass balls. Um, that's not the story at all. Um, it really is PG rated. Um, you probably all, probably down in Cannon Square, you've seen the pyramids of cannonballs. How do they get those to balance? Clue, right now, the ones you see around on shore, they're all well, spot welded in place so nobody gets hurt. In the old days, they had brass rings and you would put the base down, you'd put, and where the monkey came from, I think maybe monkeys juggling stuff. I never found that connection, but those interlocking brass rings were known as brass monkeys. And then you pile the next tier of cannonballs, another brass monkey, and more cannonballs, okay? When it gets really cold, the brass contracts much quicker than the big iron balls. And then, of course, all the cannonballs go all over the place. Um, they were not on board ship. You couldn't possibly, even with the brass monkeys, you wouldn't want to put pyramids of cannonballs on a ship. They actually stored them in what looks like bowling alley um, ball returns. They were in troughs. So the, the pyramids are nice ashore. You see them on parade grounds. Um, you see them near cannons and stuff like that. But that's where cold enough to freeze the balls off a brass monkey. Has, um, so that's where that comes from. But really PG rated. The vision I have in my head, though, is of the snow monkey sort of glancing down to the side. Um, so... <laughs> And I have no idea what's wrong with uh, with what's going on with this, so because I'm seeing it perfectly on the screen. Um, 
Any other of those phrases that were sort of rotating around or? No? Yeah, I was trying to pull them together. Oh, thank you. Part of it was to try and do that. And that's, did everybody see those little things rotating in the beginning? The little, it was trying to put together a little narrative kind of thing, um, rather than just going A to Z, on, <laughs> start with A1 and end up with whatever the last term is. But um, as I say, some of these are, a whole lot, you know, are above board, high and dry, on the rocks. You sort of think of those and you go, oh yeah, I see the connection. And then others like binge or filibuster, I'm looking at some of these. Um, well, loose ends, you can figure it out, batten down the hatches. Uh, big wig, another one that may, probably didn't come from at sea, but the officers, the more important the people were in the 17th, 18th century, the bigger the wigs. So, and ashore as well. So if you were really important, you had a big, huge wig. So big wigs were the the captains with usually Viscount so-and-so or son of some Earl or something like that. And the gentlemen of the afterguard, and they had the big wigs. Um, and that reminds me of another one of, of take down a peg. They used to hoist the officer's flags to the masthead. So when the admiral came aboard, his flag got hoisted. When the admiral left, his flag got taken down. Under it would be the captain and the, the various lieutenants. Not only when you left the ship, if you got demoted, you were taken down a peg because you lost your spot on the, the mast. But they actually were tied off to pegs on the side of the mast. So. That's where take down a peg comes from. Um, yes. I don't, but some of these terms were, did come from the French or Spanish. Some were Old English. I don't honestly know. I, I don't speak any other languages, so um, it's a good question. I, I don't know. Um, but a lot of them are, yeah, um, three sheets to the wind. I was talking about that in the beginning. If the sheets are the corners of the sail on a square sail, it's the bottom corners. On a jib, it would be the, the jib sheet or the main sheet. You can understand if a tall ship, if three sheets are loose, it's going to sort of wander like a drunken sailor. Um, the other alternative, which some people say is really stronger, comes from the sails on a windmill. And a lot of times they were five bladed. So if they pulled in the sheets on three of those blades, it's sort of, it, there's no way to balance it. Um, it got very wobbly, the whole window got wobbly. So uh, that's one of the other ways that, where that term comes from, is from the windmill. Um, what else? Um, bitter end, those are rope terms. Blazer, we've taught black book or blacklist. Anybody here been blacklisted? The Admiralty put out the rules of what the responsibilities the sailors were and what punishments went with what infractions. And they put them out in a three volume set called the Black Book of the Admiralty. Captains kept a black list, which is as a sailor, if you violated something, sailor so and so you know, asleep on duty, and you went into the blacklist and there was a punishment associated with that. So being blacklisted was not a good thing. That carried over certainly into the McCarthy era and to this day of being blacklisted. What I found fascinating was if you go out, and I wish I could bring them up, you can actually go online. Um, Oxford, or Oxford University Press still puts out Black Book of the Admiralty in three volumes. Now it's in two. The third volume was the appendix or something like that, or the index, and it's it's now connected. And I thought that was interesting. You can actually still buy it <laughs> for those that are really interested. If you're really interested, you can go on Amazon because it's available digital. <laughs> uh, 
as the Black Book of the Admiralty. It's not black, um, at least in their ads, but uh, you can actually get it on Amazon. So, um, or through Google Books, I think. So, um, I don't know. I'm going to leave it there. If anybody has any others, I'm happy to hang around for a little while. Um, there's a handout as you go. Thank you. If you're interested, there is a handout with some additional terms, selection out of the 200 and some odd. Uh, just some additional food for thought, and I may make canoeists out of all of you. <laughs>